What happened when an Irishman, raised as an Englishman, wanted to establish himself back in his home region? Today, we're talking about Hugh O'Neill and the fight for control of Ulster. Hey everyone, this is Christine. Welcome to Footnoting History. If you're one of our subscribers, you may remember that my very first podcast was about the English going to Ireland in 1170. If you missed it and you're curious, you can always find it in our archives on footnotinghistory.com or on iTunes. Today, we're going to somewhat continue that. We're looking at the latter half of the 1500s, and the English and the Irish are still very much tied together. In England, the Tudor Queen Elizabeth I is on the throne, and her government's reach into Ireland is quite far. In fact, there remains little aside from one region that still hasn't quite been brought to heel. The area in question is Ulster which makes up a large part of what we today know as Northern Ireland. On the island of Ireland, there lived three types of people at this time, and this is important to know. First, the Gaelic Irish. They were the population that was Catholic and did not have any English blood. After that, there were the New English, who are aptly named because they were the most recent people from England to come to live in Ireland, and they were Protestant. Third, and finally, we have the Old English. These people mostly lived south of Ulster, were Catholic, and they were the descendants of the Norman English who arrived during the time of that last podcast, so the time of Henry II. In some ways, you could say this last group was a hybrid. They shared a religion with the native Irish, but they were also devoted to the Protestant English queen. I mention this because Hugh O'Neill, our topic for today, was also something of a hybrid. Long before Hugh was born, which was sometime around 1550 if you're keeping track, his Gaelic Irish grandfather was given the title Earl of Tyrone by King Henry VIII. When Grandpa O'Neill died in 1559, the family had a whole lot of conflict over who was going to be his successor. It was eventually decided that our Hugh, who was still a child, was the heir to this title. In the meantime, another O'Neill, called Turlock, took on a different title in Ulster. That was the Gaelic one of the O'Neill, as in the O'Neill is the title, which meant that his lordship in the area derived from the rules of Gaelic Ireland and was not granted from the Tudor Queen. As such, England looked to the next in line, Hugh, as an investment of sorts. He was Gaelic-Irish by blood, so he would be accepted by the Gaelic-Irish people of Ulster, but he was also a possible holder of an English title in Ireland. This was an interesting opportunity for the English government. If they handled Hugh correctly, Elizabeth could one day have a Gaelic-Irishman who was working in Ulster for England's interests. So. Our little Hugh was raised in various English households with an English upbringing and English education and exposed to all the things a good little English boy should be. But then Hugh grew up. The English didn't really dispute his claim to Tyrone, which was actually one area within Ulster, and neither did the Gaelic Irish. He served under Queen Elizabeth's banners in a number of military ventures, learning along the way the ins and outs of English military minds and making friends with his peers. Elizabeth even went so far as to tout Hugh as one of England's own. Still, Hugh knew that the land he was going to have control over wasn't the full extent of what his grandfather had held. Lots of that original land had been lost in the years after he died. He really wanted to claim the fullest extent of the O'Neill estate, and he made numerous motions to do so. This raised some eyebrows of the English officials in Ireland, who wondered what it would mean in the long run that the Irishman was already asking for more than they wanted him to have. Nevertheless, in 1585, Hugh was officially given the title Second Earl of Tyrone, and in 1587, 
an agreement was made with the English government concerning his future. Elizabeth agreed to give Hugh the same grant his grandfather had received from her father in 1542, ignoring all the messiness that had happened after it. This obviously made Hugh very happy and made many of the Englishmen defensive. As they saw that Hugh was not going to be made to answer to any of them and was going to have power in his own right, they became significantly less pleased with this arrangement. For his part, Happy Hugh returned to Ireland and spent the next few years establishing himself as the most powerful man in the region of Ulster. He married and remarried not only himself, but his sisters and children in order to create alliances. Needless to say, it brought snarls to many faces that the man meant to be the crowned person in Ulster had now amassed a virtual confederation of Gaelic friends in the north. The English officers took exception to Hugh's growing power and leveled accusations that he was hiring mercenaries and conspiring against the crown, reaching beyond his level of authority. Hugh, not one to be pushed around, had his devotion to England tested until it finally snapped. He grew tired of being doubted and discredited and basically thwarted in what he viewed as his rightful domain to oversee. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the Nine Years' War or Tyrone's Rebellion. You can choose the title. Well, by 1595, Hugh was in full rebellion. Two things happened. He was officially declared a traitor by the English crown, and he did something that made a pretty big statement. He shed the English title Earl of Tyrone and took the title that had belonged to Turlock until recently. That was, he became the O'Neill, taking up the mantle of independent Gaelic power in Ulster in lieu of the English-given power that was constantly being undermined. Or, simply put, it was game on. What came next? Well, first, he continually engaged in negotiations with England. In between the bursts of violence, there were periods of truce where parties met to try and hash out some sort of agreement, but most of them failed, or rather, all of them failed because the war continued. Second, he looked for help from abroad. The Spanish and the English weren't too friendly, so he reached out to them for a helping hand. His negotiations included offering the crown of Ireland to a Spaniard if their help was what pushed him to victory. Negotiations with Spain were slow going, so he decided to appeal to a third source of help. He knew the new English were his enemy, so he had to go for the old English who lived outside of Ulster. To do this, he played the religion card. You guys are Catholic. We're Catholic. Queen Elizabeth is Protestant. Who the heck likes her? He even went so far as to ask the Pope to excommunicate anyone who continued to follow the Protestant Queen. But that request was denied, no one cared, and he had to hold out for Spanish help and count on his Gaelic friends and keeping them very close. When the Spanish finally show up, which you would think would be a massive huzzah moment for Hugh, they do something rather inconvenient. They land at Kinsale. Kinsale doesn't sound like a terrible place, and I'm sure it would be lovely at any other point in time. But Hugh's war was far in the north of Ireland, and the place that the Spaniards landed, it's about as far south as you can get. The English caught a whiff of this unfortunate polar separation of Hugh's forces, and they were on it immediately. Hugh grabbed his men and ran down the length of Ireland to come to the rescue of the Spanish troops and to gain a victory in battle that would give him the upper hand in his negotiations with England. You may want to put your head on the desk now to avoid the thump that's going to come at the next statement. The English not only defeated O'Neill at Kinsale, they did it before the Spanish even had a chance to join the fight. You can only imagine what that does for morale. Well, the English morale must have done well, but the Irish morale, not so much. The end of the war was now near, but it was not immediate. Hugh held out through repeated pillagings and crop burnings until the English had pretty much decimated the north of Ireland, but eventually they realized he was not going to give up, and so in 1603, negotiations began again. 
we should probably note that 1603 was a big year in English history. It was the same time that Elizabeth I died, taking the Tudor dynasty with her, and we see Stuart King James VI of Scotland add King of England to his list of titles. But the English were able to speed through the negotiations with Hugh before he found out that Elizabeth was dead. He was probably more than a little perturbed to find out that he could have tried his luck negotiating with the new king before he agreed to anything. But he didn't know Elizabeth was dead, so he made the agreement anyway. Either way, you could say Hugh got off better than could be expected. He had to give up his Gaelic title and his ties with Spain, but he was allowed to once again be the Earl of Tyrone. Basically, the lucky devil had driven England mad for almost a decade and been granted exactly the same status that he had been given by Elizabeth back in 1587 before the rebellion. You can practically hear Hugh's detractors yelling, what gives in the background of all of this? They weren't quite done with Hugh yet, these enemies of his. Even the Ulster lords, who were once on his side but had defected to the crowns when they realized Hugh probably wouldn't win, were upset by how little he was punished for his rebellion. It seemed no one wanted to see him consolidate power again. His enemies worked together to find secret places under his jurisdiction that could be called back as crown lands, so they wanted to take away places from him that he could control. Sir John Davies, who was acting as a crown official in Ireland, sowed the seeds of discord among the Gaelic. He even got one of Hugh's sons-in-laws to speak against him, claiming that some of the land granted to Hugh actually belonged to his family. The hope was that instead of letting Hugh control the north of Ireland by himself, his area of control would shrink and Ulster would have lots of smaller rulers with an Englishman placed above to control them. Suffice it to say, the case did not go easily and it was set to come before King James, who, in 1607, when this was going on, had been on the throne for less than five years. Before that could happen, though, something very strange occurred. Other Ulster lords decided to abandon Ireland because they could no longer handle the difficulties of ruling their lordships. The war had killed their land and their economies and just ruined absolutely everything. Now, you wouldn't be out of line to say, cool, now Hugh could take control of their lands too, and he could become even more powerful. But that is the opposite of what happened. You see, Hugh left with them. The story goes that while he was planning to go to England to see James, he was warned that if he did, he could be arrested and probably killed. The other option was to run away, or leave, or flee, or go into exile, use whatever terms you'd like. Historians, however, have dubbed this the Flight of the Earls, which to me sounds both like a title for a novel and an instrumental piece of music. But let's say it was a very real historical event. James declared him an enemy, just as Elizabeth had before. If Hugh thought he was going to Spain to begin a second round of attacks with their help, he was mistaken because at this time, Spain was trying to mend its own relationship with England and didn't want any part of this Irish business anymore. Never returning to Ireland again, Hugh unfortunately became ill and nearly blind before he died in Rome in 1616. Now, you have to wonder, if Hugh had been allowed to act as Elizabeth's man in Ulster without contention, would he have rebelled? Did the English push him to it or was he just biding his time until he had established himself before pressing out from Ulster? Sadly, since he didn't leave a journal behind telling us his innermost thoughts, we will never truly know. But for centuries, historians have speculated, and the story itself remains as interesting as Hugh's definitive attentions are elusive. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, 
The best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.